Hello, everyone. Welcome to our very first webinar on the HTA, European HTA regulation. What's changing and why it matters. Seekers and I are really excited that we are able to present this webinar to you. And uh, it's the first of uh, uh, many more to come. So um, hope you will enjoy this today. Let's first start with some introductions. A secret, if you want to start. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, uh, I have a background as a specialist in oncology. Uh, I have worked for many years now in the EU regulatory system, uh, working on oncology drugs. Uh, and uh, the last few years, I also worked in parallel at the Swedish HTA agency. Uh, and there I worked on reimbursement applications and also joint clinical assessments under EU NETA and also the Nordic co collaboration called PINOSE. Uh, but the, even more importantly to today's topic is that I worked uh, on the HJ regulation uh, while it was being developed and also afterwards uh, on the implementation work. So that's my credentials for this, mm -hmm. this talk today. Chantal, what about you? Yes, and, uh, uh, and I think we have really great complementary backgrounds and we've been working now on the HTA regulation and all its aspects uh, since we both joined uh, uh, SSI at that time in the A uh, two years ago nearly. And, um, and my background is really uh, uh, in uh, uh, a consultancy mainly, actually. So where I started as an, uh, also as a medical doctor, but then more in, uh, um, I did a research in um, health economics and epidemiology. And after research and some pharma experience, I really went uh, into consultancy and I've done a lot of work in market access, HR, health economics. So from that angle, have been working a lot on, on all kinds of payer requirements, HTA requirements, understanding, and also how to generate those kind of evidence. So uh, together, we've been doing deep dives in bringing our expertise together, deep dives into the EU HTA re regulation, and we feel ready to um, support. So what will we be doing today is really, it, it's, a, it's a first webinar, like I said, it's really about uh, the basics. Um, so what is, uh, and it starts even with what is HTA, because I know that that's for many of us not even that clear. Why do we have HTA? What is the HTA regulation all about? What are the, and how is it intertwined with the regulatory and HTA uh, activities? How are they connected? Um, we talk about the GCA, the GSC, and of course, importantly, the challenges uh, that come along with it uh, alongside with the opportunities and how you can best navigate. At the end, we will have a Q&A session. So we will welcome everyone to put your questions in the chat and, they, uh, and we will try to address as much as we can and otherwise we will definitely follow up with you later. So. So what is HTA? Uh, well, you can see that's one of the hurdles uh, of a drug or a device on its way from an idea to the patient. Uh, and of course, there are many different hurdles during that journey, especially during research and development, uh, financial, scientific, uh, whatnot. But, but there are also two major uh, external evaluations that really impact on the future of your product. And that is, of course, the regulatory approval for drugs. Uh, and then we have the pricing and reimbursement process. Uh, at least in Europe, this is uh, essential for, for getting market access. And in order to evaluate uh, a drug or a device for that purpose, that's where health technology assessment comes in. Uh, so here is a, an abbreviated uh, definition uh, from a recent uh, consensus definition. Uh, essentially, a health technology assessment is the process of determining the value of a health intervention with the purpose to inform decision making in the health system. And the health inter intervention can be a drug or a device typically, but also other things such as uh, diagnostic uh, procedures or, or computer programs uh, and things like that. So next slide. Uh, so why do we even need HTA on top of the regulatory assessment? 
Well, that's because uh, the, the regulators and the HTA bodies have different remits and answer these different questions. Uh, and as I think most of us know, uh, the regulatory uh, question is about the absolute benefit risk balance. Uh, it's whether the drug is effective and safe enough for approval. And this is what is called an absolute balance because here you are comparing different aspects of the, of the drug, let's say, uh, with itself, the safety against the drug's own efficacy. There's no comparison with another drug in that decision. Uh, this is quite in contrast with the HTA uh, assessment, which is always a relative thing. So, so it always includes relative effectiveness and safety. So that part is the same or the similar all over the world, I would say. Uh, and it often also includes cost effectiveness. And in both these instances, you're comparing uh, the product. Uh, the, what, or the, the question is, what is the added value of the, of the product compared with another available therapy? So that's why we have different assessments. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, there, and there are more differences between regulators and payers, right? So um, regulators are very well organized, actually, in, 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 in the European Union with the European Medicines Agency. With, it's a single licensing system and legislation with well-agreed and defined assessment criteria. The vast majority of our drugs go through this system in the European Union. And um, and it's, it's there, I think, for... I would say 25 years uh, approximately. So it's, it's there for a long term um, and very well organized. And then if you move to the payers, I mean, we have 27 member states in the European Union with also 27 different health technology assessments and pricing and reimbursement systems. And there's nat national legislations, there's different methodologies and different assessment criteria, which is it's very scattered actually. So in that sense, um, I mean, it's it's a it's a great movement. I think that we are moving towards and kind of an EMA like system. It's not exactly the same, obviously, but where, where the payers are also coming together, HTA bodies. Let's say that HTA assessments and HTA bodies are coming together to create a single system. And there's also more collaborations in terms of regulators and payers. They're also intensifying collaborations. And ultimately, it makes a lot of sense because although they have different remits, the clinical evidence is the common ground for decision making. You know, it's 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 even in cost effectiveness or HTA, including in cost, it's all the base. It's all about the clinical evidence, relative effectiveness and connected to the new HTA regulation. There are. There have been more intensifying and, and ongoing formal collaborations between uh, the EMA and the HTA body says payers in Europe. Uh, there are a couple of uh, aspects mentioned here, and it's uh, uh, and it's I would say it's there now. It's it and it's expanding, and um, and I think this is a very important point for all of us to realize that this this basically emphasizes the importance of an in implementation of an integrated strategic thinking where you would optimize your study and you would timely think about readiness from both a regulatory and an, an HDA uh, perspective, um, at least in Europe. But perhaps we should add that the, the assessments, the market authorization and this EU level HDA assessment that we will be talking about, they are still completely separate in themselves, just yeah. to clarify. Yeah. Just to clarify its importance. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's dive into the regulation. Uh, this slide actually summarizes some of the most important things to, to know about the regulation. Uh, so first of all, it's a mandatory uh, assessment that occurs at the EU level. Uh, you, you have to do it if you're in scope. And furthermore, it runs in parallel with your marketing authorization procedure. Uh, so you can't choose when to do it. Uh, it's also important to note that the, the purpose is actually to harmonize and facilitate the, the national HTA assessments across the EU countries. 
uh, and thereby to speed up market access. Uh, so, so the intention is really good. Uh, and this is, I think, a first step uh, we can see it as. So that's important background information. Then what's it all about? Well, it's all revolves around two uh, key EU level activities. Uh, and the first is the mandatory part, the joint clinical assessment. And this is about clinical relative effectiveness and safety. Uh, nothing more, no economics or anything else, just the clinical data. Uh, then we have this supporting procedure called joint scientific consultations, which is the equivalent to um, the regulatory scientific advice. Next slide, please. Yes. yes, so when will this all happen? Well, uh, I think we are all getting a bit nervous because it starts in January 2025, uh, but it will be a stepwise implementation. So not all uh, drugs will be in scope from the start. Uh, it will start with new medicines um, uh, that apply for marketing authorization in the EU. Uh, in January, and only those drugs that are for the treatment of cancer and ATMPs, which is the European way of saying cell and gene therapies. And all medical devices that are in scope will start uh, from, from already uh, next year. Then uh, in 2028, uh, orphan drugs are added to the scope. And then uh, in 2030, after five years, all new medicines and also all new indications that are in scope will, will have to undergo the, the, this mandatory JCA procedure. Okay, next slide. Okay, so which products are actually in scope? Well, it is essentially all products that uh, are seeking market authorization through the EU centralized procedure. Uh, and as you may know, uh, there are certain drugs that have to go to, through this centralized procedure for their uh, authorization. Uh, and, and they are listed here. It's biotech uh, products, for example, antibodies, ATMPs, orphan uh, drugs, and then also certain therapeutic areas, uh, as you can see here. Uh, next slide, please. And with regard to medical devices, uh, it's a bit complicated definition, but, but in essence, it's uh, three types of high-risk medical devices. Uh, class three, implantable devices. Class 2B, uh, devices intended to administer or remove a medicinal product from the patient. And C, class D, in vitro diagnostic medical devices that concerns transmissible agents, for example, viruses and such. Uh, and even if you fulfill all the uh, criteria, there will still be a selection uh, done by the European Commission through the coordination group, uh, according to a list of criteria that is outlined in the regulation. So you, you are not sure you have, will have to do that if you have a device in scope. Okay, so now let's look at how it fits together with the um, regulatory activities. So I will start explaining this slide and then Chantal, you can fill in the dots as it were. Uh, so in the beige uh, arrow, you see the, the different phases of drug development. And above this uh, timeline, we see the regulatory activities in, in light blue. And below we have the HTA activities. Uh, where the European level ones are dark blue and the national ones, or one is red. So please take us through this, Chantal. Yeah, and I think like you can see very well from this picture, it's, it's really crucial to realize that the timelines for the regulation run completely in parallel actually with the regulatory activities. So um, the, the, if we look, if we zoom in the joint clinical assessment, the JCA, you see that um, the regulatory process, the regulatory submission is actually triggering that uh, JCA process. And it starts with a request for dossier. 
and, and the deadline is then already 100 days later after the first request. Uh, but there's also good news, I would say, because the publication of that assessment is already published 30 days after the EC decision. And that forms the base for national decision making. So at that time, you're actually already in a good shape with a document that will um, hopefully put you in a better position to then uh, start your local negotiations. Because ultimately, the decision making, the decision on, you know, how do we value, how do we value this uh, um, relative effectiveness and safety, and how do we balance that against the cost? That's, that remains a national decision. So after the 30 days, there is this first piece in hand and that goes to the national authorities and um, depending on the speed of the, of the manufacturers, so in that sense, there's, there's still, the, the whole timelines are fixed. So you have to comply to these timelines. But then after, when it comes to the national decision-making, it will be uh, more like it was before that you have, uh, you can make decisions on how to prioritize countries and how to move forward um, from there. So the, it, it, it's mostly in that relative effectiveness part where you, where you have the, this fixation. And lastly, but not least, you can also see that the scientific consultations uh, are also in, um, connected. Uh, why They're not necessarily connected, right? So you have a few options. You can either, it's not mandatory, so you can not do it, not recommend it. You can also, um, but you can you can do it together. So purely 100% in parallel. So there's a parallel procedure that you can do where you at the same time submit for both regulatory scientific advice as well as uh, joint scientific consultation. And then you can also uh, choose to kind of pull it apart and take different moments and go for one after another, um, depending on, on, on what fits better. But more about that later, I would say. Let's let's move on to that joint clinical assessments. Yes. Uh, let yes. me see. Well, what is that all about? And also, I think importantly, let me explain a bit what that is not about. Uh, so basically, like we already said, EU level assessment is about relative effectiveness. And we refer to that actually as the clinical domains. It's the problem, it's uh, what is the standard of care, uh, what is the relative clinical effectiveness and safety to that. That's all part of the JCA. Um, it's high quality joint work on common scientific clinical aspects, agreed methodologies. This is how we assess clinical relative clinical effectiveness. And then the other aspects of HTA that's, that's uh, Sigrid explained earlier, like economic, uh, economic evaluation, but also everything that's around it, basically, that, that can be part of HTA, what we call societal domains. Um, actually, in HTA language, sometimes it's called non-clinical, but that's too confusing, I would say, from a regulatory perspective. So I, we prefer societal domains. They remain at the national level, like I just be, uh, said before, and are not part of the JCA scope. Yeah, so let's what talk about scope? that scope. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Yes, so what is really important to know is uh, that we already mentioned this, but it, let that sink in that you will not decide yourself what to send in, but you will get a request from the HTA assessors uh, at the beginning of the procedure of which analyses they want to see. Uh, so this is the, the assessment scope. Uh, and it's, as we said, it's about relative effectiveness. And this of is often referred to as the PICO uh, based on this acronym that you can see here, where P is the population and for a drug, that's the sort indication. Uh, but it could at least theoretically also be a restricted reimbursement population that the HTA agencies are interested in. Uh, I is the intervention, that's your drug or device, uh, including the backbone treatment, if, if you have that. Uh, and then C is the comparator, and this is what is often called the relevant comparator in HTA language, which is uh, some version of the current therapy standard of care. Uh, it can be the cheapest one sometimes available. So, so this is what the HTA bodies will compare the new drug or device with. And then O is the outcome. So that's the, the endpoints and analysis 
that the HTA assessors want to see. So this is the peak go, the assessment scope. So now let's look at the other procedure, the, the joint scientific consultations. Uh, and as you can see here, uh, the purpose of this is to um, facilitate a future joint clinical assessment. Uh, next slide, please. And here are some facts about the JSC. So here is a citation from the regulation regarding the scope. Uh, they shall concern all relevant clinical study design aspects or clinical investigation design aspects, including all the aspects of the PICO. Uh, so that's what they are about or should be about. Then we have two eligibility criteria, which both must be fulfilled in order to be granted a, a, a consultation. So firstly, uh, your drug or device must be likely to have to undergo a joint clinical assessment in the future. And secondly, the clinical studies or investi investigation must still be in the planning stage. Uh, and at the moment, it is uh, not clearly defined what this means. Uh, and we are still awaiting some of the legal acts, the implementing acts uh, regarding this. So I think this will be further clarified uh, in a few months. Uh, uh, so we will come back to that perhaps in a future webinar. Then what will happen in, in a consultation procedure? Well, it will include a meeting with the, the company and an uh, outcomes document will be produced by the HTA side with their re recommendations. And it's important to know that uh, these are not legally binding for either the company or, or the HTA side. So next slide. Yes, and here is a little bit about the pra practicalities around the, the consultations. Uh, you, you will have to uh, apply for this through a special IT platform that is being created for, for this purpose, for, for the purpose of all communication actually with the HTA, EU HTA, uh, also for all other stakeholders, patients and, and, and experts. Um, and there will be a number of slots for JSCs uh, published and then you can apply for one of those. And if the number of slots uh, or, or the number of requests will outnumber the number of slots, let's say, then there will be selection criteria applied to, to, to prioritize which um, request will, will be granted. And, and you see those selection criteria here. And I think uh, it's fair to say that the first two unmet medical needs and first in class uh, will be probably the most important ones. And we should also mention the parallel consultations, which you already did, Chantal. Uh, you, can, you can have a, a, a joint or a parallel, it's called, uh, but it means that the, the HTA people and the regulatory people are in the same room, but they, have, you, they answer different questions uh, that you submit to them. And you can have them also if you have a device together with an expert panel. And, and then you should uh, put the request uh, for this to both uh, instances at the same time. Okay, let's go on now. Challenges. Well, and I want to emphasize before we go, because there are a lot of challenges that you can imagine, uh, especially probably after you've seen those the timeline before. But... Um, in principle, I think we are of the opinion that it's a great movement towards a more centralized and unified approach, right? And actually, um, the um, it it and it will require changes and it will come with challenges. But ultimately, um, if those are resolved or implemented in the companies, I think we we are we should be in a greater shape moving forward as Europe. However, for today, it's uh, uh, the, the, the biggest challenges we have identified and that we have heard from, from even big pharma companies that we you know, work with. It's not just the small companies that are worried and, and face challenges as everyone, basically. Um, first of all, and that's, that even counts for us, there is, uh, 
it's there's unfamiliarity with the uh, JSC and the JCA processes. I mean, uh, we'll we've dove in a lot into it, so we we feel quite knowledgeable about it right now. But of course, it's a very new procedure, and there's little time to learn and adapt, and, and there's uncertain impact. We have to see how it will play out, right? Um, so, and they are, uh, it's uncertain also on the assessor's side, oh, yes. I, I would say. So there is like they're to be getting some... nervous as well. Because, <laughs> yeah, are they problems. ready and are they able to even process and, and, and assess what they want uh, mm -hmm. uh, companies to provide? So I think this is a very, this is everywhere. And this is with any change implementation, I think. Uh, but this is a big one. And then I think particularly for uh, um, for companies, I think also for the assessors because they have strict timelines too, but from a timing perspective, um, there is typically, and especially I would say for small uh, uh, biotech uh, and pharma companies, it, it requires a much earlier planning for, uh, for the GCA and the, and the TSC is needed than what companies are doing today. Like um, typically, uh, a more sequential approach is often taken, right? You focus very much on regu regulatory approval first and you start in parallel slowly to think about HTA needs. But now that slowly, yeah, that's not really possible because you have to be ready for that JCA dossier at the very same time as you are ready uh, more or less uh, for uh, to submit your MAA. And, uh, and also from a uh, joint scientific consultation perspective, these are can only be done when the clinical evidence generation is still in planning stage. So that's more or less at the same time as you would normally go for scientific advice. Um, and uh, so, and there's also not, not, not an option to escape and to say, well, thank you, not for me, because they're really linked to each other. Uh, so this is, uh, I think this is an important aspect and it really requires uh, uh, companies to change and even investors to change. Uh, it, it is changing for you in that sense. And then, of course, last point is there is uh, this it does this increased expertise may be needed uh, an increased expertise may be needed in the methods because um, there is a lot around uh, uh, indirect treatment comparisons uh, coming uh, going on because if there is no direct comparison like in RCTs uh, available, there's we need to find other ways to compare versus um, the standard of care. And it's not the expectation that now RCTs will change and we'll have multiple arms addressing all kinds of different uh, comparators. Uh, no, it is, the, it is the expectation that there will be more a heavy focus on those indirect comparisons, develop methods to that and how you present. And it's it's quite technical. So that's, I think, another aspect that uh, um, we all need to be ready for. Keeping in mind that I think on a personal note, that in also in regulatory um, uh, indirect treatment comparisons sometimes become more used than old days. So in that sense, it's another uh, ex example of where methods are somehow coming together for the right uh, purpose. Yes, and, and then if we <laughs> no, go into the, some yeah. specific challenges around the, the joint clinical assessment, uh, and we have already talked about this, the, the, the challenging timelines uh, for, for the dossier compilation, the 100 days that you will have from the request uh, until you must submit your dossier. So you really must plan ahead and have a lot of it done as early as possible or before you go into this procedure. So you only com complement with the new PICOs that you didn't an anticipate yourselves. And of course, it's a challenge to do this in parallel with the MAA procedure where you will receive list of questions from the EMA. Uh, and another thing that can happen and happens sometimes is that the indication uh, that was initially applied for is changed during the marketing authorization review uh, based on the regulator's request. Uh, and this can then create new PICOs during the JC procedure uh, where there is a possibility for the assessors to post questions and ask for new evidence, but with a very short time frame to answer that. So that you will always be in a hurry uh, trying to answer this. 
And then the not, another big question that has been debated a lot ever since the HTA regulation was adopted is the number of PICOs that, that everyone has been very afraid of, but uh, I think perhaps a little bit uh, less so now, especially after the JCA Implementing Act was published uh, earlier this year, uh, where it is really stated that uh, they also changed how, how the picoscoping should happen uh, in order to try to get as few picos, different assessment scopes as possible. But nevertheless, it is really expected that there will be multiple relevant comparators in order to, to satisfy the needs of different member states. And every new comparator will be a new assessment scope, a new analysis to, to perform. Uh, and also it's possible that the HDA agencies uh, can anticipate that this there will be problems with the cost effectiveness if you have a very uh, advanced and expensive drug. Uh, and then they can ask for uh, analysis for other populations than, than the um, sort indication just to be prepared for a restricted reimbursement population. So here are just some of the things that we are quite likely to face, actually, uh, at least in some procedures. Okay. Yeah, and then and then actually to go to the next slide, uh, I think there's even more to come. Where is the next slide? Okay, now back. <laughs> Clicking too fast. Because basically the first medicines in scope are oncology and AT&P and then followed later by orphan drugs. So... This is not even the most easy assessment. The, most the difficult easy. ones. <laughs> <laughs> the most easy assessments are the ones that are, you know, in, you know, big populations uh, um, with solid RCTs with many patients in, etc. But now we are even in a situation how to deal with um, single arm trials and expedited pathways where the standard timeline does not apply. Also, when there are our uh, circuit endpoints where the regulatory approval is based on that are not of interest, direct interest to HTA bodies. So there is there is more. And um, so it's very um, interesting uh, uh, how, how this will play out, but also I think great um, uh, importance to kind of anticipate how best to deal with all of these things. And that's where we are going now, how then to best to navigate uh, as a company uh, um, this new situation. I the first thing I would like to say that, to my opinion, it should not be let's not come to Europe because I think uh, ultimately it's not about building extra hurdles. It's and and that's not that's not the aim at all. So I um, uh, it's it's not about let's let less drugs in or etc. It's really how can we speed up the process and how can we be more unified. So. Um, so I think uh, we need to prepare for it and there's a need for change. And I think uh, there are some key points here. And in general, I think that evidence generation and synthesis strategies needs to switch to a much earlier point. It should be kept in mind already in a clinical development stage. And I think that everyone, I don't know how many on the, on the, on the line are with an HTA background or an HOR background. This is like music to our ears. But I think even before, even 10, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, I was already stating we should be involved earlier because it's important to, to think about evidence generation that you need and that you make you ready to ultimately have a successful launch and market access and not just uh, evidence for regulatory purposes. But now I feel that there is a, a stronger push because the timelines are fixed. Um, so this, and also I think there is a change in how the partners in, in pharma or advisor companies need to collaborate and, and maybe even uh, a shift in responsibilities because ultimately what we have been talking about today is really about uh, clinical relative effectiveness. This is not about cost and economics and, and commercial. This is really about generating the right evidence about your product and um, you know, uh, I think this is really a collaborative effort between ultimately market access uh, but, but and uh, clinical development and regulatory. So I think there is um, collaboration is important and siloed working is not going to help. Um, and, and Chantal, yes. 
wouldn't you say that perhaps even smaller companies can can have an advantage here where you, where you don't have the silos in place where you can actually start building uh, these collaborations uh, from scratch or from an earlier model so to speak uh, so they might I might not necessarily you. be in a bad position just because you're small you can you can handle this more proactively perhaps yeah, very well. Very valid point. Uh, I think that this is the challenge of big companies that have been so used to siloed working that this is, is different. And it's more. So I think if you are small, if you are agile and small, this this sh should hopefully be an easier uh, um, job. So very, very valid point. Um, of course, it's also, you know, companies need to be ready to build these highly technical and data driven dossiers timely. So that is the more skills involved. On the other hand, since it runs parallel at the MAA, I think there are, there are, there are efficiencies there. There is a lot of overlap. There's also a lot of non-overlap, I, I, of course. Um, but I think also there, it's, it's the power sits in, in the efficiencies that you can gain if you really pair up. Um, and, uh, uh, and of course, be ready for those evidence generation activities. And I think that another part is that identification of these relevant comparators uh, for Euro and uh, Europe and other PICO elements, such as which kind of outcomes are important, uh, needs to be done in advance. And like Secret explained, you can never be, you, you cannot be sure about what PICO will be requested from you until very late. But I think, like, I mean, uh, you can predict to a very large extent, just based on what we know today already about what HTA bodies like to see. That's not going to change upside down. You have a very clear picture how European countries are looking at, uh, at what they think it's important. And we just need to see next year how it's going to come together. But um, uh, I think it's important to do some scenario planning there and to start early because then you can say, OK, let me lean backwards. We will probably be fine. Or if we have a major gap, how can we going to address those gaps? Um, and then um, the medical, ultimately, since it's about standard of care and it's about where does it fit in a treatment paradigm, um, and, and it's really important, I think, to proactively, timely consult clinicians and patient advocacy groups uh, as an evidence generation uh, stage to kind of pair up and make sure you are ready and really understand what is the environment you're looking at uh, yeah. in an early stage. Yes, and Chantal, uh, don't you think that this preparation uh, aimed perhaps primarily for, for the EU could also benefit other geographic areas such as the US, uh, that the marketing activities there, if you do the evidence generation, the clinical evidence generation uh, well in advance, uh, thank, thanks to the, G the, the European regulation? Well, absolutely. I don't think, you know, with also with the uh, with the um, uh, Inflation Reduction Act, things are changing. I think also the U.S. is moving towards and it's called they call value based healthcare. Uh, ultimately, value is, is, is sitting in value for patients. It's very connected to market access to what payers like to see. So I think ultimately it's not about just about Europe. I think even in other geographies, you see switches. Uh, and, and the UK, that's, uh, you know, UK is, this is, uh, uh, these, these, all these aspects are important for the UK as well. So I think that in, in, in essence, this is where we are moving. If this is, uh, and, and I think in general, think early about, um, about uh, what do I need in terms of evidence to satisfy all stakeholders is, is very important. So I think it's, uh, I think it's an opportunity in that sense. Yeah. But of course, that's because it's also our <laughs> our passion so uh but i i in that sense we're, uh, we're excited um and then you know if you think about how to best prepare and when to start i think we we have listed a few questions here that i think would be very helpful to ask yourself will my drug be in scope when will it be in scope and what are the expected timelines from for until MAA for the for the phase three study design, um, uh, CTA and the uh, and the IND filing, and um, how certain or uncertain you know are we about what to expect in terms of potential PICO scope? Um, how are we generating the required evidence? To what extent is there a big gap between what we do and want to do and plan to do in the phase three uh, versus what we can expect? 
And is that an issue? I mean, uh, there's often big gaps, not necessarily an issue, but you know, it's something to assess. What well, it's a risk assessment, right? And then, of course, connected to that, should we request? And are we still in in scope to be able to request J uh, and C? And when would you do that? And uh, do you have a strategy in place for a timely, high quality JCA dossier? And we have here, you see a timeline here. And um, you, you see, you know, we would ideally see, start thinking about it uh, in early uh, development already, you know, when moving into your pivotal trials. Um, and it's not necessarily like a big, a big investment at that time. You can do a high level assessment and take it from there and go deeper and deeper as you move on. Um, but a, a, uh, at least a high level assessment. Where are we in terms of these questions? Should we be worried or can we lean back a bit? The earlier the better. And then you have all options open in terms of evidence generation, but also should we be requesting JCA, et cetera, et cetera. And then ultimately in parallel with your MAA procedure, you will move into G JCA preparation and, and, and make sure you have the evidence that you need to generate uh, done in advance. Yeah, and I, I as I, I really love this picture or slide that you have done and, and that light blue box here in the middle where you think about and use the time while the pivotal trials are running to actually meet the other expected picos that, that you will not be able to cover in, in your pivotal trial. You have that time then. You have a lot of time, months, that where you can create additional evidence to meet the HTA uh, PICOs. Absolutely. Very quick, before we go to the questions, to the key takeaways, Sigrid? Yes, this is what you want to remember. Uh, first of all, regulators and HTA bodies have different uh, scopes or remits and therefore different evidence needs. Uh, and secondly, uh, the, the, with the HTA regulation, the deadline for the dossier submission is fixed and runs in parallel with the marketing authorization process. So you can't avoid it you and you must be ready for it. Uh, and the, the scope is uh, uncertain until very close to, to your actual submission uh, when you have 100 days. Uh, and for this reason, actually, it's really advisable to go for a joint scientific consultation to, to get as much po uh, information as possible on the what the likely PICOs will be. But then, of course, if you have a very changing landscape, uh, there, there will, could, can still be new PICOs uh, arising at the, very, at the very end or close to the dossier. So with taking this together, uh, Chantal, please summarize. Yes. Be on time. <laughs> <laughs> Work together and be on time, in timely preparation. And I think then that brings us to the last slide where we first will really uh, big, do a big shout out and say thank you for, for listening. And we really hope to see you at the next webinar because we will dive deeper and, and the next webinar will really be more about the JC, uh, JCA requirements and how does such a dossier look like? So that's already like a little spoiler for next time. And uh, and then we want to move towards Q&A uh, for the remaining of the time. And we have already some questions in. So um, Secret, maybe I can give you the floor to start yes. addressing the first question. Yes, uh, this one is about something we mentioned briefly. What does it mean that the clinical studies should be in the planning stage in order to receive a joint scientific consultation? And as I said, uh, this is not clear uh, yet because we are still awaiting the implementing regulation uh, later this year for this. And there has been different interpretations um, discussed and also I received from the European Commission. I, I asked them myself uh, and where, where where it was a similar interpretation as at the uh, EMA has, uh, where, where it essentially uh, they said that it should be before the pivotal trial design is set. But but then I think there is an opening to have it later, but we will see what, what, it, uh, what comes out of the implementing act because uh, I think uh, 
because you will not, in many cases, be able to address all the anticipated PICOs in your pivotal trial. I think it would be reasonable uh, to have a joint scientific consultation later with regards to those um, analyses, which are actually key for the HJA assessment. But we will see. Uh, I have discussed this with people in the system, and I, I hope we will get a, a good answer on that. Uh, so that was that. Uh, I have one question from Sylvia. Uh, will the January timeline for joint HGA for oncology products be from time of marketing authorization, submission date, or validation, or submission slot? And uh, according to the regulation, it is uh, this date, the 12th of January, when, when products will be in, uh, when, when the HGA regulation will apply, that refers to the submission date to, to EMA. Uh, so if you apply from the 12th of January or later, and you are in scope, you have an oncology drug, for example, then you will be uh, technically in scope, but not until the, the validation of your EMA application has come through, then will actually the procedure start. Uh, so the date is based, the 12th of January is based on the MAA application date. But then you will know after that has been validated by EMA. Uh, so do we have a question for you, Chantal? Yeah, I saw a question from Emma. Um, very good question. Uh, the question is, could you elaborate on how the review of the uh, of the JCA versus the economic level reviews components will occur? So the clinical components versus the economic components. Does the country level occur later? And will it still, and that's important, still need to include the clinical components? So it's a very interesting question because that's that has been part of debate, right? So yes. Of course, uh, on a country level, um, you will, and it will remain, you have an assessment or an evaluation of the uh, of the clinical as well as the economic components. Um, how it should be or what is intended is that the clinical, the JCA dossier should serve as the clinical base and that should be more or less sufficient for countries to make uh, um, their appraisal, so to make their consideration about how they value that assessment and then connect that to the economics. It's a little bit uncertain though to what extent the national bodies will continue to do what they used to do and still say well I need this for my country. They're not supposed to do that but now it's seen in the next years to come is how much of a um, how much of a of an of resources they're still putting in their own clinical assessment or whatever, but just take the report as is and start doing the value judgment and, and putting it in balance with the economic components. So it's it's to be seen, but um, uh, typically uh, um, they have to make a, a, a judgment call based on both. Yes, uh, I can have one other question here from Amanda. Uh, how does EU regulatory acceleration impact data availability for the JCA? Will a regulatory approval be delayed as more data is needed for JCA? Uh, uh, good question, but, but uh, th these two procedures, while they are connected uh, also by law through the HTA regulation, so, so that uh, the the, the the publication date of the JSA must come 30 days after the marketing authorization date and no later. Uh, they are they, they are not interdependent. They, they don't depend on each other. Their, the results don't depend on each other. If a JCA will not uh, be able to meet the requirements, uh, then that procedure can be stopped uh, in advance. And, and it doesn't at all impact on the regulatory procedure. So, so that's important to know, I think. Uh, yeah, I hope it was clear. Do we have any more questions here? Uh, I can do one. Um, I got a question on, can you elaborate on when companies should start thinking about the national pricing or reimbursement during this process? Um, and I would say, 
that doesn't really probably change so much compared to what companies are the decisions company are making today and um let's let's reflect a little bit on big pharma companies who are planning to market the products in all these countries themselves i mean they typically prioritize um countries where they want to launch first and then they start rather early and the and the initial thinking around prioritization and uh, what does it take but also what is the value proposition what is the commercial opportunity in each of these countries that thinking typically starts already before a uh, phase 3 clinical trial is 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 underway um uh, as you move towards the development of a phase 3 clinical trial and then you 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 move on um for germany and UK, for example, typically the reimbursement dossiers for those specific are already also at the time of um, of um, MEA um, um, uh, uh, or uh, uh, authorization about product authorization, regulatory authorization. Uh, but t- but typically a lot of countries follow later, and that's where 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 the difference comes in here. So yeah. I hope this helps a little bit for my market access backgrounds. Yeah, and I found a connecting question about that from Emma. Uh, could you comment on any requirements of this legislation to launch in different or all countries in Europe at the same time? And then I can say that this regulation, the HTA regulation, does not have this requirement. Uh, but I think you are thinking of the, the, the update of the pharma legislation that is being processed now, where this has been they have tried to put in incentives in this direction that you could have extra market uh, protection if you launch in all countries within two years and things like that. This has been very much debated and it's not clear at all that this will actually be in the final pharma legislation and it's it's not part of the HTA regulation. Yeah, so. good points, very good points. Secret, do you have other questions that we can, maybe we have time for one more question and then I think it's it's time to close. <laughs> yes, I, I have this question here. Uh, what does it mean that the PicoScope should not be data-driven, but based on policy needs? Uh, and this, uh, people keep Good repeating one. this. You hear this <laughs> in, in webinars all over. And, and uh, But what it means in practical terms is that you can get uh, ask requests for analysis that you didn't uh, do perform studies for. You can, if you have a pivotal pivotal studies with certain comparators, you can receive a request for another comparator. That is the essence of, of this um, statement that is everywhere. Good, good question. And, and it's, uh, yeah, it's a good question, and I uh, and and what is important here to consider, and this is how how payers and regulators always have been a bit different you know you request a regulatory approval for this drug in this situation and then you, you hope for the best payers are like okay this drug is coming in my face and what does that mean for my country uh, and what does that mean for my budget and therefore they determine okay for me it means this and this is relevant so I want to know um, how um, how uh, this new drug does compare to what we are doing all along now today. So I think it's really it makes a lot of sense that it's not data driven. It's really based on what is the question that the the um, the payer would like to address or the HA body. So and I, th- I think secret uh, unless you have. Uh, a very important okay. last message. I think is it's, it's time that we close this webinar and we collect. Other questions, and we and we and definitely provide also maybe suggestions on topics where you really would like to know more about, because we then will uh, may take that into consideration for a net, next webinar or a later one, and uh, because we're very happy to further continue to addressing your questions.